everyone. Thanks very much for coming today. I'm Molly Starbuck, Director of the Duke Office of Postdoctoral Services. And I'd like to welcome you to the second in our Spring F32 series. Today's discussion is with four of our Duke Postdoc F32 awardees. Uh, so we'll be having two more of these workshops uh, for the next two weeks, the same room, the same time, same day, both the same day, from the same place. So today we are very pleased to welcome Catherine Dickerson, who is a postdoctoral scholar in Cognero, who goes by Katie, also our outstanding postdoc, yay! <laughs> <laughs> she was awarded an F32 from NIMH, and Ryan Schweller is postdoc in biomedical engineering. He was awarded an F32 from NHLBI, I don't even know what that National, National Heart, Lung, Blood Institute. Okay, Institute, all right. And Daniel Skelly is a postdoc in biology. He was awarded his F32 from NIGMS. That's one of the biggies. And Ashley Williams is a postdoc scholar in the Molecular Physiology Institute. She got her F32 from NIDDK. So uh, many of you submitted questions in advance. Thanks. We'll start with those. And then feel free to join <coughs> with questions. So I'd like to ask that we begin by um, if y'all could tell us a little bit about your background, your department, your area of research, and how long you've been a postdoc, and then we'll get to the nitty gritty of how many times you actually had to apply before you were awarded. So would you like to start? Sure. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Dan. I'm in the biology department. Um, so I'm interested in, in genetic basis of complex traits, so things like um, common diseases in humans, like, like diabetes and heart disease are, are these are things that we would we think of as complex traits. And I use yeast as a model system to, to study uh, the genetic basis of complex traits. Um, I've been in postdoc for three years now. And is that everything I was supposed to say? Yeah. Okay. My name's Ashley. I work over at the Molecular Physiology Institute downtown in the Carmichael building. And I'm primarily interested in type 2 diabetes. I did my PhD in whole animal physiology and am very interested in how mitochondria regulate insulin action in the muscle. So I've been here for approximately one year, about this month. So. Hi everyone, I'm Katie. I'm uh, in the Center for Cognitive Neuroscience, so I sit just across the street in the LSRC. Um, I'm really interested in trying to understand how motivation impacts learning and memory in humans, and uh, both healthy humans, and um, how the dopamine system, which is very related to learning and memory, and uh, how that interacts with a variety of different disorders. And I'm studying this using some real-time functional neuroimaging techniques. Um, I've been here for a while. I've been here for four and a half years. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm Ryan. I'm in the Department of Biomedical Engineering here. Um, my research is pretty much in biomaterials, so we're really interested in um, kind of how we can uh, develop kind of custom materials to promote vasculogenesis, angiogenesis. So doing this both uh, kind of in vitro and in, in, uh, in vivo settings, and doing a little bit of work in terms of regenerative medicine in the, kind of that same area as well as. Um, Kind of spinal cord uh, regeneration. Um, yeah, I've been here, I guess, almost four years now. Great, thank you. Could you all um, describe your experience applying for the F32 or reapplying in the case of those of you who maybe didn't get it the first time? Would you like to start? Sure, I'll start. Um, so I basically came here to Duke um, in May of 2013 and sort of decided right away that um, I wanted to apply for postdoc fellowships. I applied for you know, three or four of them, kind of all, all the standard ones that people apply for. Um, and so I, I think I shot for like the fall deadline. I came here in May, and I think I shot for applying in September. Um, and I don't know if you all know, but it, it often takes a very long time to find out what your score is on the grant, and so um, by the time I found out the score of my first application, it was almost time to do a resubmission. And so I actually ended up, I was kind of on the borderline for the first application, and it ended up being funded on the first application, but I did apply a second time because I didn't know if the first one would be funded or not. <laughs> so um, I'm sure we'll get into how the scoring works at some point here, but, but that's how it worked for me. 
<laughs> well, in, in a way, it wasn't bad because it, um, you know, do, doing these things a second time sort of forces you to really think about, you know, what was weak in your first application, and and by that point, you've got feedback from the the reviewers who looked at your application, and of course, a lot of that will make you mad because it'll be things you can't control, but some of it <laughs> will help you to. You know, really make a better research proposal. So I applied prior to finishing my PhD. I reached out to my current postdoc mentor about a year before I was about to defend my dissertation, and she said she wasn't sure about her funding, but here's an opportunity for your own funding. And so we discussed potential specific aims over the phone, and I applied maybe eight months prior to defending my dissertation, and fortunately everything worked out really well. It was kind of more unique, I guess. I don't know how common that is now, but it worked out pretty nicely. Katie? Um, I did not get, get it on the first time, and I only know, other than you two now, one other person who did receive funding the first time. My At least through MIMH, it seems like many people. I, so. Half of them, as my understanding is, half of them aren't even scored or really discussed. So when we submitted, um, my mentor was like, let's just hope it gets scored and discussed. Because <laughs> if we get really good comments back, we can try to fix it. So that was really our goal, um, was just to try to get enough feedback. So yeah, so the first time around, it did get scored and discussed, and we got a lot of feedback. And so I, I started in November of 2011. I submitted the first time in August, and then got all the information back in December again. I don't think it would have been, been in advance enough to, to fix it. So then I waited, and I actually reapplied not again until August, because I was trying, I was hoping to get more publications and things like that to help. Um, so I reapplied basically exactly one year later, and then it got funded. Um, Um, uh, so I'm also kind of in a weird situation. So I joined my uh, my PhD or my postdoc lab um, <coughs> two weeks before it moved institutions, and so I had this great grandiose idea that, well, I'll hang out in the office and write my F32 during this process. <laughs> Didn't really happen. So actually, kind of moved here in, in July of 2012, and then I actually didn't end up submitting until um, December of that year, so I, did, I was on that cycle. Um, I ended up having it on my first try, um, but um, that was essentially the process, so within, I don't know, a little less than six months of, of uh, kind of being in the lab is kind of the timeline for my submission. Okay, and um, Dan, you, you brought up scoring, so we, you know, maybe we can just go ahead and go there. Is there, how does the scoring work is there like a bright line for all F32s? Does it vary according to institution? So maybe uh, people can chime in here if I'm wrong, and I'm not sure if I'm right. But uh, my understanding is that as, as someone said, there's essentially half of them that are not scored at all, um, and half of the grants that the institute receives. And out of those that are scored, they get um, a, a sort of priority score, and the lower your score, the, the higher your chance of getting it funded. Um, it's I think it does vary institute to institute. Some yeah. only give you like a priority score, some give you a percentile, and some give you both. So, so um, at least from my experience with NGMS, um, you, you're going to need to get a score probably lower than about 30. If you're like in the 20s, that's pretty good. If you're in the 10s, that's like really good. And if you're in the single digits, like no one gets that. Um, and so I got a, I got a 27. And as I was saying, I was kind of on the border there. Um, and, and my understanding is that there is actually a fair amount of uh, sort of jurisdiction on the program officer's part in terms of um, deciding who gets the funding. So they don't have to give it to everyone that gets the lowest scores. I think um, one thing that actually kind of helped me was that I was in a lab that um, that didn't have a lot of funding. And they saw that if I was going to continue in that lab, I was probably going to need this funding. So I, I think 
I, I don't know either way, but I, I suppose that that helps me. Yeah. Um, so they, for at least NIMH, I think this is for everybody, they, uh, they rank you on five things, or five things are scored. So you as the applicant, your mentors or your mentor team, um, your research plan, so like all the experiments you say you're going to do, um, the training plan, or just like your career development, all your activities, this sort of thing, and then the environment. So there's just five separate categories. Um, I was reviewed by three people. So for each of those five categories, they, as Sam was saying, they, they score you from one to nine, with one being the best and nine being the worst. And then for all, they, they average across all of those categories. And then they multiply by 10. So you want basically like the lower your impact or priority score is, as Sam was saying, the better. Um, so you can control like some of those things more than others, I think you were alluding to. Yeah. Um, if you're applying at Duke, I think we're lucky, like the, at least for my department, Duke always gets an outstanding in, uh, score for the environment. So it was like that. I felt really lucky that I'm like, okay, I don't need to worry about that one. It's going to be awesome. I think that I don't think anybody gave it, had any weaknesses at all. So usually after they give you the score, then they break it down by, you know, you as the applicant, these are your strengths, these are your weaknesses, and then the same thing from your research mentor team, these are their strengths, these are their weaknesses, and that sort of thing. Um, so, yeah, so it's a little, seemingly a little backwards, and it's lower, and I think, as um, Dan was saying, like, the first time around, I got an uh, impact score of 35 and a percentile of 31, I think. So it seemed like too high to be funded, but you can talk to your program officer, because as you were saying, there's no, like, strict cutoff. Um, and if they really like the project, or maybe there's like some need, they might be more willing to try to push it. Your program officer, you really want to be your ally. Um, I think we'll talk about that a little bit. Um, the second time around, my score improved tremendously. So I, I was shocked. I got an impact score of 19, and I was in the sixth percentile, um, which seemed crazy. <laughs> but it was really interesting, because my program officer was still like, I can't tell you it's going to be funded. Like, we really think it's it's really positive, it's really low, it's excellent, but I can't promise you anything, because they're not the ones that actually make the decision, they just advocate for you. So, it was that was the interesting process, because you're kind of like waiting and waiting, you get the score, you look, and then you're just like trying to be patient and hope that things pull through. Um, I've also heard of other people getting, you know, scores kind of on the borderline, um, that you can really get bumped up or down, but sometimes it literally depends on the budget. So I had a friend who recently got a K award, a very good scoring, and the budget hadn't been determined. So we were just, <laughs> we didn't know what the cutoff was gonna be because the government had decided had not decided yet what the budget was, so yeah. So it's kind of a funny process that way. Uh, I was going to say, I'll echo kind of what she said too, um, I got a, a pretty good score on mine right off the bat and even contacting the program officers at that point, no one would give you any sort of confirmation about that, so at that point, um, you know, if, if you think you are on, on the border or something like that, I mean, I think that it's, it is smart to, you know, to start thinking about um, responding because they will not give you any sort of confirmation until they have that um, budget allocation meeting. I, I will add one of the things, that, um, all of us being from different institutes, um, there is variation um, between the institutes in terms of, um, I guess, how difficult it is to get awarded one of these mm. things. Um, you can go on the NIH website and you can download the, the funding rates by institute, so you can see you know, there are X applications and, and Y of them were funded, so you know, if your, your research could fall into like multiple institutes, you might want to sort of strategically choose which one you're applying to. Yeah, that's a really good point. So how did you know um, that you were ready to apply? I mean, so we, obviously they're very competitive, but past only to get scored. How did you know that you were ready to apply in terms of publications and research experience? Or did you just go ahead and apply anyway? Uh, I'll, I'll jump in. Uh, uh, I, I mean, I don't know that there's a, like a kind of a, a threshold that you have to be at before you can apply. Um, I definitely do know that like the committees want to see that you've been productive. 
So I think that if you've had a productive kind of PhD, there's nothing that says that you can't um, apply right off the bat in, in your postdoc, or you know, obviously even before you start your postdoc. Um, like I said, I applied about six months into my, my postdoc. I did not have any publications, you know, first through umpteenth uh, author, you know, nothing really to show from that standpoint, only kind of standing on my, my PhD work. So from that standpoint, I think that as long as you've, you know, kind of got your name on some stuff and you kind of have, you know, a, a relatively decent CV, I think that you're kind of in a good uh, position. They are not going to expect you or they're not going to require you to have any publications from your, from your postdoc. I think that potentially if, you know, you uh, didn't have a lot of uh, publications in your PhD, it might kind of help to bump you up. But uh, and from that standpoint, I think that really just being there and uh, having a, an advisor who uh, is willing to uh, support your application is about all you need uh, to be able to kind of move forward. Yeah, I think, I mean, it's hard to say. There's no, like, right number of publications, and it varies so much across fields, right? Mm -hmm. Some summers take forever to publish, and some fields are much faster. Um, I think they want to see some, yeah, record of publication from your, for your PhD work. If you have any prior funding, I think that always helps. Like, if you had an NRSA as a graduate student, or I was on a T32 the first year that I was here, so I think that helps. I think. A lot of what they're doing is trying to look at you and see if you have good potential. Like, are you worth investing in? Um, and if there are things that, you know, like I did not have that many papers when I submitted. I think I had three. One was for my undergrad, so only two of my papers were my PhD. And from, yeah, I hadn't published anything for my postdoc. And um, when you have situations like that, you can have my letter writers. I ask them to try to address that a little bit. Like, I was in a lab where my PI was brand new, this is the first time we were doing neuroimaging, I had to learn all this blah, 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 whatever. So they can try to help like advocate for you and say, you know, she's, she's whatever, this, that, the other thing, she's worth, you know, we, we think that she has a lot of potential. Um, so I think that that can help. If you have any things, you know, any breaks in your publication or anything like that, if you can have your letter writers advocate for you, I think that helps a lot. Yeah, I think it is important to have the letter writers mm -hmm. kind of inform the reviewers how the progression of your work mm -hmm. has come because, you know, I know I was in a very complex project in my PhD mm -hmm. and that came across in the letters of recommendation and so it was kind of shown in a positive light, you know, in perseverance mm -hmm. and creativity and, you know, they do account for where you are in your training. So when I was applying prior to completing my PhD, I had one first author paper in review, <coughs> and they noted that, but they also stated that that's an appropriate place for someone like me. So, you know, all the abstracts do count. So all the first author or co-authored abstracts from meetings, you know, I think a lot of people are good into eventually turning those into manuscripts and then you know, each lab has their own way of dealing with that. And then, you know, co-authored papers, again, you know, if they're in review, that helps. If you have some from previous experiences, that helps. But I think they do kind of think about where you are. So if you've, you know, only been a postdoc for a few months, they understand that you're probably still getting work out from your PhD. And if you have your letter writers address that, then I think everything should be fine. Yes. So, so are, are you using your thesis advisor as a letter writer as well as people? Okay. I think it's pretty much expected yeah. um, okay. on that. And in fact, I think that there's even some people who say that if you're not using your yeah. thesis advisor, you need to like address potentially why not. Okay. <coughs> Other questions? So Katie, you mentioned the importance of the program officer. Maybe y'all could talk a little bit about that. Like, how, how do you get the program officer on your side? How often can you contact him or her without bugging them? Like, that kind of thing. Um, yeah, I can, I can start, although I didn't actually interact with her that much beforehand. So I just sort of went for it. Um, I don't think I emailed with her at all before I submitted the first time around, which I don't, I would not recommend. I think it's really good to try to establish a relationship with them. So I know other people who have emailed ahead of time, you can send them your specific aims or tell them like roughly what you're thinking of. 
Make sure you do your homework ahead of time, though. Really look at the institute and see what their funding priorities are, um, and then use that language specifically. It helps the reviewers tremendously. Um, so after I got my reviews back, though, then I really started interacting with her a lot and talked with her about you know what the critiques were, how we could make them better, what our plan was, and then really just tried to do every single thing that they asked. Like whether or not I thought it was a good idea, I was just like, that's fine. I'm not going to be able to talk to the reviewers. I can't justify things. So I'm just going to do everything that they ask. So hopefully they won't complain. <laughs> and that approach, I think, worked well. Um, so then after it looked like it was going to be funded, I also talked with her a lot because I had to, um, this I was not expecting, I had to prepare a memo. So even though it was a very good score, there were still critiques, of course. Um, and so she wanted me to draft, I think it ended up being about six pages, um, of all addressing every single one of the critiques. And I, did you guys have to do that? No. <laughs> <laughs> maybe if I, I don't know, maybe she was extra worried, um, or she just thought it would help. But, but I mean, I think this goes back to the fact that they, they sit in the room and amongst the people, so they, it's interesting, they get to listen to the reviews and the critiques, and then when it comes time, they really can advocate for you. So I think she wanted that in her hands so that she could say, oh, okay, reviewer, blah, 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 well, this is what she said, this is her plan, this is why she has few, you know, fewer publications, and this is how she's going to fix that, or, you know, this is this other issue with recruiting subjects, and she's going to do this. So. Um, yeah, so she ended up being super helpful. But yeah, you want them to be your friend. <laughs> so how do you how do you find who the program officer is? I think it's listed right on the website. Okay. As, yeah, if you look at the institute, I think it will tell you just the name and their contact information. And it's fine to just cold email them. Mm -hmm. You can maybe CC your mentor, but just saw them you're thinking of applying and you would love to chat with them. And, I mean, this is their job, right? So they're used to talking to people all the time. Yeah, your mentor might also know yeah. through previous times they contacted them. So is there a program of, like one program officer per institute or oh, is it a program so officer they're, they're, for the other they're for the institute? Yeah. yeah, they oversee different um, funding mechanisms. Yeah. So there's probably going to be a specific program officer um, for F32s. Yeah. Um, yeah. And maybe they oversee some other ones, but there will be there should be a specific person for F32s. So you have a cover letter that you'll submit with your grant, and it, I don't know if yeah. You posted this, but in mind, I, I suggested sort of what section mm -hmm. it should go to within the institute. And I can't even remember how I figured out what the sections mm -hmm. were. I think that that must also it's be also on the NIH website. Yeah. Yeah. And so you can find who's the program director mm -hmm. or program officer for that section. And, and the section will be specifically um, based on what your research is. So, you know, within the institute, obviously, there's lots of different kinds of things that they fund. And, and so, you just have to pick the one that's most appropriate to what you're thinking about. Yeah, and, and kind of two things off of that. Um, one, um, some of the institutes do have standing committees for or standing sections for the F32s. Sometimes they are completely ad hoc, so sometimes you, you have no idea who's going to be on there until you already submitted it, and then they kind of update telling you who's on that that panel. Um, second is kind of. Uh, a brief embarrassing story. Um, so I did not contact my program officer whatsoever. Um, I submitted my cover letter and uh, listed institutes that were not the one that ended up funding my F32. <laughs> so there is a little bit of um, kind of correction within the system. Um, I don't. I wouldn't advocate doing it like I did, but um, just know that there is kind of that out there. For what it's worth, I also did not contact my program officer. So, <laughs> so everyone says that you're supposed to do it. It's probably a little bit harder in practice to do than what we're saying. Um, but especially if you're if you're taking the step of coming to this and thinking ahead of time about applying for the NRSA, then then you might as well contact the program officer. Yeah, I think they can really help. I've known people who've contacted ahead of time, and they will help you like craft your aims. They have said, no, we're not interested in this, or this is way too much, what are you thinking? So I think they, they really can help. So you can talk to the program officer, but not the reviewers. Right. There's no way yeah. of 
that as a that's Well, you'll get a list of who they are, but I think yeah. it's completely um, like a, a no-go in terms of contacting the reviewers directly. And the other thing is only a set of them are going to, and there's going to be 20 or plus people, so. Yeah. So there's a question uh, to Katie about uh, that resubmittal process yeah. work, like at work. Um, and uh, what part, uh, were you surprised by what part they had issue with? And uh, I guess what, um, what were the things that you felt like made the most difference in that um, Yeah, that's a great question. I think that um, there were some things in my, re both in my research plan and my like career development goals and like, the activities that I planned um, that I think maybe where they thought were like either too far-fetched or too much. I first proposed doing like, a, like I'll do so many classes and workshops and this and that and I'll learn all these things. And they were like, yeah, that's, how are you gonna do all this? It's too much time. <coughs> well, another thing that I did, when I first applied, I requested three years. And then since I was, I was actually on a T32 for the first year. I think you can only be funded off of an F32, T32 combined for three years total, which I didn't realize. Oops, so. <laughs> so then I changed it to request only two years of funding. I was also another year later into my postdoc, so I think there is some st strategy about thinking about how much money you want to request. Um, so I think that basically just trying to address all of their comments, so mostly with myself it was trying to publish more, which I at that point had so a few things under review. It was still, they still noted, like, she still seems slow. <laughs> I was like, yeah, it's true. Um, and then mentors, they wanted some more clinical people because I was proposing to do a study with depression. So then I added, I actually ended up having, like, two co-mentors. And then I think I had three additional people write me, like, letters of support. Mm -hmm. That can be very helpful. I was going to do, like, genetic analyses and a few other things. And so they wanted to see, they want to see that you have built a research team that actually knows what they're doing and can support you. So, you know, even if you don't end up interacting with these people that much, actually having a letter of support, I think, really helps. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and then I think the, the other things, I mean, most of them weren't too crazy, but uh, they were just trying to, like, refine, I think, a little bit. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I don't know. That yeah, that's super helpful. Okay. And then just sort of question to everyone is, like, um, in structuring your aims, um, how, how did you kind of go about um, doing that, either with the program officer or, or just with your, your mentor? It's yeah, always, oh, go ahead. I was going to say, it's always hard to toe the line between <laughs> ambitious and over ambitious. Mm -hmm. um, I do think that it's appropriate to understand what three years of work really is. And coming from your PhD, you probably know approximately what three years of work looks like. Um, you know, I think it's always good to add in extra stuff, you know, saying, well, if I have additional time or if I have, you know, additional resources, you know, we can pursue X, Y, and Z. However, th these are the main points that we want to address. And so I found at least in structuring mine, it was a nice, cute three-year project that'll probably be drawn out to five. Um, you know, we know how that goes, but on paper it looked nice. And you know, just kind of like a package deal where you can really, it's feasible for that time frame. Um, I think that was one of the largest things that was kind of coming across in the aims. Yeah, I was gonna say that, I mean, I worked real closely with my, um, my uh, postdoc advisor kind of crafting it together. I mean, kind of two things to definitely keep in mind as you put it together is that, um, A, yeah, they want something that's kind of achievable in, in the goal, in the time frame of, of the grant, but not necessarily do you have to get it all. Um, another thing to keep in mind is that uh, it's, they like it when A, you know, AIM-2 doesn't rely on the accomplishment of AIM-1, and AIM-3 does not uh, rely on the accomplishments of AIMs-1 and 2. So any way that you can kind of write in there that, you know, some of these things can be done concurrently is, is in your, your favor. And then, um, then lastly, I think they also really like the idea that each one of your AIMs has the potential of kind of standing alone as, a, as potentially a manuscript. Um, and in that regard, you know, that they, maybe AIMs 1 and 2 are two very kind of safe papers and number two, AIM 3 would be a very kind of ambitious paper is kind of a way that 
I've heard some people um, describe it. But yeah, the biggest thing is making sure that they don't rely on the success of each other. And if they do, that you have the data that shows that what they rely upon is, you know, concrete. So I was wondering um, if any of you are coming from a position where your research is not naturally relevant to health, um, or if you had if you had to sort of uh, frame your research in a different light in order to make it um, desirable to the NIH, um, or sort of restructure out an experiment or a, a more sort of disorder component or something like that in order to do that. And if you So I came from a very different PhD background than what my postdoc is in. Um, I, my work was still funded by the NIH, so it's not completely outside of the realm of, but it was very much a chemistry lab that we worked with, um, like DNA reaction networks, which has about nothing to do with biomaterials. Um, and so from that standpoint, um, I just kind of wrote everything as it was. So my F32 was just talking about developing biomaterials and the experiments that I'm going to do with those. Um, there is kind of a couple of sections in there where you can talk about your previous work, um, both a little bit in your bio sketch, and then there's also, I think, like a description of previous work. I can't remember what that document's mm -hmm. called, but you know, really kind of hashing out what that was and what the what the implications of that were. And of course, you know, at that point, you know, we did have some health relevant um, implications of that work, but you know, obviously, just kind of reiterating a lot of that stuff. But but in no way that I feel like um, not having done my my PhD in kind of the same field um, really hindered me. It just meant that I really had to be up on my literature for the new field in order to kind of really motivate my work and, and discuss it. And sort of along those lines, um, if you if you're not sure if you're how to how to cast your research in in that kind of light, um, I would recommend going to the NIH reporter website and, and checking out what are some grants that have been funded, not necessarily F32s, but like R01s or something, just to see how other, how PIs are, are casting their research. Yeah. I think of one last really thing. I think the NSF now has a postdoc funding mechanism so that if you really are not health related at all, that might be good to look at. And then another thing to just keep in mind, which is always sort of weird balance as well, is that you know, the F32 only funds your salary. So you still need funding to do all the experiments, so it can't be completely divorced from whatever your PI's funding is, right? Um, so that's, it's always a little bit funny of a balance that you need to make sure that there's actually money to do the projects that you're proposing. Although you do get, you, you get a little bit of money as a stipend for, it cover, it's supposed to cover health insurance and it, depending on how much you spend on health insurance and travel and yeah. books and things, there might be a little bit left over. If your research is cheap, you might be able to, to get by doing that. Yeah. Yeah. But FYI, if you are outside of just doing health insurance for yourself, if you have to do health insurance either for a significant other uh, or a child or something like that, you can kind of kiss essentially all that money goodbye. Um, it is not going to go that far. Um, so just. Yeah, I think it It's, it's a flat number. It's a flat number. Oh, okay. Okay. It's like 78 50 or something like yeah. that a year. Mm -hmm. yeah. So don't choose to do Cadillac health insurance. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, we can get into other things. We can talk about it otherwise, but there's a lot of other fun things that you figure out. Question seven in the postdoc FAQ. It deals with this issue in detail. <laughs> Uh, you had a question? Yeah, I had a question. So Katie, you brought up the mentoring. Um, I was wondering with any of your experiences with, say, a younger or less you know, established PI, you mentioned the committee, and I've heard of doing that. Is it people at Duke, or can you go to other institutes as well, and how do you? Like, I've seen examples where someone put that they were going to, like, schedule meetings, but they, like, got nailed still from the reviewers who were just saying, like, I guess more substance was needed. Like, how did you approach it in detail? Yeah, so I can directly answer that because um, so I work with Alison Aktok here. She's uh, an MD PhD and she's primarily in the psychiatry department, but she sits in the CCN. Um, so she's still a relatively new PI. I think she's been here maybe six or seven years. She does not have tenure yet. Um, 
she did have former trainees apply for NRSA and they were, did not receive it. I think in part because she was so new. That's a big thing. It's very hard to address. Um, she had a lot of success with her trainees getting NSF grants. Um, so when we applied, we still were unsure if it was still if that would be too much of a hit. But I think so. I think having that mentoring team actually really helped because I had the, my co-mentor was also someone here at Duke who had tenure, who had a track record of trainees doing well and getting other, you know, getting funding like this. And then two of the people who wrote letters of support were also from Duke. The last person who wrote a letter of support was, she's at UNC Greensboro, so she's not too far away. Um, and she, her primary role was gonna be to help me recruit subjects um, from a clinical population. So each of the people who, ha who wrote me a letter of support had pretty like niche roles. Um, but I would say, yeah, having a co-mentor who has a track record of like, you know, trainees getting awards and then doing well, I think really helps you. Um, yeah, I think it's hard to do that balance. I've heard similar things if you have, if you really need to split your time between two institutions, especially if they're geographically far away, it can be hard. Um, so I guess I would just try to think really carefully if there's something really specific about that mentor that you really need, or is there somebody else that can sort of fill that role for you that maybe might be you know, like closer. Did you state that you would have like meetings scheduled? Or, yeah. Like, yep. like yep. okay. yeah, you have to be, oh man, yeah, get ready. <laughs> that should, that's probably a little other question, but I think there's probably about 20 sections that you have to write, 20 different sections. Um, that goes in like the activities planned or career plan, I can't remember, but I, I was brutally explicit and detailed about how many times I was going to meet with each person, what we were going to talk about, all the journal clubs I was going to go to, all the classes I was going to take. It's really obnoxious, but uh, they want to see it all, all in glory. Uh, but I would say, I think this grant was by far the most annoying grant that I've ever, I've written, I think, about seven grants now. By far the worst, worse than helping my PI with an R01. <laughs> um, but it's also the most useful. So I am so glad that I wrote this grant because I have mined it so many times for other things, especially once you have all of this stuff in excruciating detail, all of the journal clubs, all of the things, all of the meetings, you can just reuse that material. It's been tremendously helpful. And if you know anybody in your department that's ever written one, ask them if you can see it and possibly use parts of it because there's a lot of things that are just really boring like the equipment and the facilities and you know we have like inclusion of women and children like really boring sections that you have to have but if you if you already have someone who's written out all of the details of like the MRI scanners in my instance like you don't need to rewrite that it's a waste of your time so if someone will share that with you it's really really useful sorry that was a bit of a derail but. no that was actually good because it brought up um can I, I just want to oh, yeah. chime in and say one yeah. really quick thing, of, but in terms of having mentors and mm -hmm. stuff like that, one thing that they do want, and especially if you're in a field where you are kind of resource intensive, i.e. there needs to be money yeah. out there for your research, they are going to look heavily at what your PI's current mm -hmm. funding situation is. So even beyond just being uh, young, if the funding situation or the funding climate, as far as they're concerned, is not ideal, uh, it's very good to have that extra mentor in terms of someone who will write in their letter that says, I will provide um, monetary support or funding support for the execution of this, um, uh, this research and you know have their biosketch listing, their current funding and stuff like that. So that's a very major component. So outside of just having that, that, that group um, showing that there is funding available for you to do that research is, is very, very important and they will without a doubt comment on that if, um, if they see that as being good, they'll say, oh, this is awesome, and if they see it as bad, they will definitely kind of ding you um, for not, for that. So you are judged on your, your boss kind of as they've already, as mm -hmm. people have already kind of said. Yeah. So. What I would like to add, don't underestimate what a co-sponsor could really mm -hmm. do for your application, because I am in a place where the mentor is fairly well known in the field and she also has established a very nice career for herself and her funding is, she's doing very well right now, but we still tacked on a co-sponsor who is very recognizable in the field. And so I think it can help push your application to another level if you combine two powerhouse 
PIs, especially if their work complements the work that you're proposing. Any points on that, Dan? Um, I don't think so. I maybe I'll just say, you know, I don't think you, you don't have to have um, this kind of thing. So, so I think, if I'm not mistaken, Katie having three additional letters of support, <laughs> that's probably unusual. Um, I, had, I had no letters of support and no commenter for my first application, which is the one that got funded. My second application, I added on one letter of support. Um, but so so it's, so it's good to have that, but it, but it's by no means required. And, and I think you know one thing you can take away from this is that each of us has a, had a different path towards yeah. obtaining the, these grants. And so there's a lot of things you can think about, and you're not going to be able to do everything perfectly. Um, but but just sort of look for opportunities to do some of these things that we've talked about. I think. And you brought up that there are, you know, myriad sections to this. So, and it seems like postdocs usually focus on, like, well, the research strategy, that's the most important one. And then I've heard from several postdocs they got it back and they got totally dinged on the career development plan. And they were like, who knew that it was that important? Can you talk a little bit about that, the interplay between the sections? I'll start. I'll say I just don't underestimate how to utilize in a positive light those extra sections. You want to come across as motivated, enthusiastic, like you want to just, you don't leave anything out on the table. You put it all into this application. And each part is very important. And I do feel from the comments that came back that they read every single word of that. And so if you're passionate about what you do, make sure that comes out in your application. If you had a unique path in graduate school or in your life, make sure that comes out in your application. I think that this is your chance to tell your story and it's actually very unique because very few grants allow you to come out in the application as an individual. And so I find that you need to use that opportunity positively. And you know, it's, it's hard because we're still learning how to sell ourselves in a way, but you, you essentially are selling yourselves to the reviewers and trying to convince them why you deserve this award and it's so much more than just the research strategy. So it's very important to just put everything you can into the other supplemental portions of the application. I might go so far as to say that this is not in fact a research uh, grant, it's a training grant. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So you need a good research proposal, but I might say that you should spend, you know, maybe even less than half of your time writing the whole grant on the research proposal, which is kind of backwards. I didn't think of it going into this that way, but um, but you really need to, to fo focus on having the reviewers be able to see, you know, how is this grant going to help you further your career as a scientist and achieve your career goals. Um, and, and it helps a lot to have um, to have your proposed project be something that's sort of new for you. So a new field, new skills. Um, like So in my case, I did my PhD um, in, in sort of computational genomics. So I was working on a computer all the time. And from a postdoc, I was pr proposing to learn some lab skills. And so this was sort of a really natural training opportunity for me. Um, and, and the reviewers really liked that. So, uh, so yeah, I mean, if, I guess if there's one thing I had to, to say about the F32s, it's that it is a training grant, not a research grant. Yeah, I think that's right. Because like I was saying before, your, your mentor or someone is gonna have to have the funding to pay for their studies. So, so your science might not actually be that tremendously different from what they already have funded. Um, so you really need to convince them that this is going to really help your career um, and enumerate all your career goals and all of the things that you're going to do, all of the workshops and things that you're going to um, participate in that will help you learn and get you one step closer. Um, so I think, yeah, being really detailed. I would definitely recommend trying to look at funded applications. Um, that's really helpful to see how detailed people, people get. Yeah, just don't, est don't underestimate the effort that needs to go into the auxiliary documents. Yeah. It's not one of those things where you can spend all your time doing the research statement 
and then think you're going to hammer that out in a day or two. It's yeah. much more time intensive than. Yeah. The research was actually, I found, the easier part mm -hmm. because that's just logical. You've been yeah. doing this for so many years. It's actually these personal essays that are sometimes the hardest to write because you have, like, you know, just an example, you have two pages to discuss your doctoral dissertation and other research. And how do you start that? You know, it's like it's been a while since I've written a personal essay. Mm -hmm. And so you have to kind of start over and you want to fill all two pages. You know, that was. One of the things that I was told early on is do not leave white space. If they give you two pages, you write two pages. If they give you one page, you write one page. It needs to be a very well thought out, constructed one page. But you know, also you want to come across as someone who's putting in the effort to make sure that this application is as best as it can be. Yeah, I think I saw a really good example of that section where, um, and I followed this sort of template. Someone had sort of organized their research by aims and so like it, their prior you know their PhD work broke it down by aims and then for each one said this resulted in if it's possible like you know a, a first author peer reviewed publication in blah 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 so really try to emphasize no matter what it was something that you know you hopefully produced or you gave a talk at a conference or anything like that so you try to directly link this project and I accomplished this this project and I accomplished that and make it really clear I think it's it's True, it's a good point you want to fill up the space, but you also don't want to kill the reviewers, slamming them with just total text. Like, you want some white space, I think, to give their eyes a break, try to make good use of figures and things like that. Um, I, I went to a workshop on how to write good grants, and I recently just reviewed, or just participated in some test grading for, for like eight and a half hours straight, and it made me think of the reviewers, that they're in these like windowless rooms, for eight, nine hours a day, multiple days, all they do is read these grants. Good writing, I'm telling you, is the thing to invest in. If your writing is poor, or English is not your first language, and you need help, get it. I think it's like one of the most important things. If, if people are struggling to follow your writing, it just makes it a hundred times worse. And that's what I've heard from other grant reviewers, is that good writing can really save it. <laughs> It's just very hard to review these things for hours and hours and hours, and you don't want them to just chuck it because they can't follow it. Did you get other people to read it? Like, oh yes, many, many people. <laughs> yeah, I think that's really helpful. Other questions? How long did it take you guys to write your proposals, and how did you balance that, like, if you were finishing up your PhD and publishing things as well. And also living. <laughs> I budgeted about a month. Um, I think it can all be done within a matter of three weeks, but those are some really long, intense days. Um, the aims you do have to think about for a little while, yeah. but the rest of it, I mean, you, just, you can just hammer it out. Um, and then there's so many sections that if you're kind of stuck here, you can go to whatever 20 sections there are and start working on something else, come back to that. Um, you know, you do need to give time for edits for your research plan, so that's where your mentor will be involved specifically. And, you know, so you'll send them your specific aims, they might edit it, you might write the research plan, send it back, so you might have some back and forth. Um, it, it was a long month. Um, for me specifically, I have to say balancing everything. I was working with a summer student. I was trying to finish up stuff. It, there was an agreement between my PI and myself. I asked if it was okay if I did this because essentially it was going to kind of take me away from the bench for about a month. Um, but that was an agreement that we had. Unfortunately, he was very kind and generous and said, you know, if you want this job, you have to do this. And so, you know, all parties had to be involved for sure. But. Um, you know, it's going to be a, if you take a month to do it, it's going to be intense, but it'll be over. Unfortunately, you know, hopefully things will just work out. Yeah, that's mine was the same. I think I worked on nothing else for at least a month solid. And I think that was also after I knew what my aims were going to be. Um, obviously, there was editing back and forth, but I did, I think I did nothing else for that time. And I would echo what you said that if you want to stay in science, you, you have to publish and you have to get grants. So I think it's tremendously important to apply for grants even if you don't
get them. It's a really good experience. I hadn't, I didn't write any grants as a graduate student, and my PI was also somebody who, you know, we always knew when he was writing a grant, he would say, send me a figure about this. Okay, but I had no idea what the process was like. It was really just a mystery to me. Um, so I think doing it is really, really helpful, and it's a really good experience. I'm a super deadline-driven person, um, so I started about three months beforehand because I knew that there was a private foundation fellowship that was due like at the end of October. So I essentially wrote everything to be able to submit to that, just as almost like a, a run-through, and then I had everything sitting around and was able to polish that until the December deadline. So I, I guess maybe about I took about a month to do that, and about then it was almost two months until the, the deadline. There is a cutoff, right? Like you can't be on be beyond X years beyond your PhD for the F32, right? Or is it? It's interesting. I think there's some gray area for training. Like I was kind of reading about that the other day. I don't you can't quote me on this, but I think if there's still potential for training mm -hmm. and it's still very novel, then there's a way to still pursue that mechanism. So there's a postdoc in my lab currently who had actually had a very unique path where he did a one-year postdoc abroad and then he returned to the States to go back to his PhD mentor's lab for at least six months to a year and then he started in my current mentor's lab and so he's actually been out of his PhD for close to three years and he was recently funded in October. So I think there was still so much potential for him, which I thought that there was a like a deadline, and which is why I applied so quickly. And um, but I think that the deadline is either three or four years. Yeah. Yeah, something like that. Other questions? If not, we will.